mix into the melting pot. Then we move into uh, the second era, which is the era in the late 1800s of industrialization and urbanization. This is a time at which we needed a lot more labor in the United States. So there was no really debate about whether or not we needed immigrants, but we certainly saw more diversity in the immigrant population, Southern, Eastern, um, Europeans, more Jewish people, although not quite so many as later. Um, and there certainly was restriction, restriction of sentiment at the time, although major legislation wasn't really passed um, in the beginning of this period. So this is a cartoon um, of that era where the Italians are, are depicted as rodents coming directly from the slums of Europe. You'll see them with their knives and their mafia hats, anarchy bandanas, and Uncle Sam is just letting them swarm in. This is another one like that. What I think is interesting about this one is that you can see the aristocracy on the shore of Europe sort of cheering as they're getting rid of their least desirable people, which of course might remind you of some comments about Mexico sending us their least desirable people by our president. Then we get our first restrictionist law in 1882. What was happening then is that lots of Chinese laborers had come over to help complete the railroad. The railroad companies brought them over. And there was a slight economic downturn in 1873. Uh, and some white laborers were having trouble finding work. And so the Chinese workers became the scapegoat. They were taking the jobs. They needed to be sent back. Uh, and so because the West was more powerful at that point um, in Congress, they were able to get this Chinese Exclusion Act passed that was ultimately in play for 80 years. And it banned Chinese people from the United States. Uh, so here's some cartoons from that era. Um, where the, This is an Irishman and a Chinese man, and they're together on the top. They're eating Uncle Sam and the bottom. And, but then at the end, the Chinese man eats the Irishman. <laughs> This is a swarm of locusts, of Chinese locusts infesting. And you often see them depicted as rodents or apes or insects. This man is interesting. This guy is named Wan Kim Ark. Um, and he was the first test of birthright citizenship, which um, was the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, of course. And um, Wan Kim Ark was born in the United States. Uh, U.S. citizen, born in the United States, but his parents were Chinese, and he happened to be in China visiting family when the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And so he came back on a ship and was told he couldn't enter um, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and his case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the test of his citizenship. And the Supreme Court, essentially, it was pretty racist holding if you read it today, but essentially the Supreme Court said, if we don't grant citizenship to uh, U.S.-born people of Chinese descent, then what are we going to do with all the white people that are born in the United States? Um, so we can't divide them. And so, yes, birthright citizenship is a thing. Uh, and so I bring this up, again, not necessarily for this audience, but you know, the, the president has threatened several times recently to alter birthright citizenship by executive order. And of course, that cannot be done. This is a constitutional amendment and um, centuries long standing Supreme Court precedent. This is a man from Oregon offering Chinese people the option to stay and be killed or to jump in the ocean and drown. Then we reach phase three, which is the early 1900s. This is the height of the eugenics movement. Of course, we're seeing more refugees coming from um, Eastern Europe, more Jewish refugees. And this is when the restrictionists really start to pass the legislation that achieved, uh, in my opinion, the whitening of America for about 40 years. The first one is the literacy test of 1917, which said that any immigrant coming to the United States must be literate. That was mostly aimed at Southern and Eastern Europeans. Then the big one, the 1924 National Origins Quota Act. This is really what did it. This is what made America white for the next 40 years. And Congress at the time really grappled with how to pass a racist, restrictionist piece of legislation that would survive court. Um, challenge, and they did it. They, it took them a couple of years and a couple of tries, but they did it. Essentially what they did was they limited immigration, and they allocated the immigration to the, um, the allocation of the population of the United States. So they said, you know, if 80% of the people are from England, um, then we're going to give 80% of the visas to people from England and the United States. And they uh, specifically excluded Africans, African Americans, uh, you know, Asians, Southeast Asians, 
basically anyone of color. Uh, but these are some cartoons about the Italians during that era. Here's an Italian depicted as an ape-like person cleaning someone's shoes. This one is hard to see, but it's a lot like the rhetoric we hear today. The top three are the Italian population. and the top left, they're just laying around. They're being very lazy. And then in the middle one, they start to get drunk. They're drinking a lot. And then on the right one, they start to fight, and they're being violent. The bottom left is how you arrest them, you round them up and you beat them and you put them in paddy wagons and then the bottom right is how to dispose of them, which is to put them in cages and drown them in the ocean. This is a ship of Jews during that same period. Again, all depicted you know, with the prominent noses. You'll see even the ship, even the fish swimming next to the ship are drawn this way. And then a cartoon that I think we could see in a, in a you know, news outlet today, which is an immigrant who has a ticking time bomb for a head with a bedroll that says undesirable, trying to get through the wall. So all this led up to phase four, which is the immigration structure that we've had in place since the civil rights era. It was passed in 1965, and it was a recognition, it was a correction of the racist laws of the past, and it was a recognition that what matters to the United States in terms of immigration policy is the unification of families, keeping families together and allowing U.S. citizens and permanent residents to petition for their family members to come live with them, and a recognition that employers need to be able to find foreign labor, both skilled and unskilled. And this is the system that we have in place. It's primarily a family-based immigration system with some employment immigration and then some miscellanea, which includes asylum. Uh, so in a minute, I'm gonna shift to talking about asylum because that's what everybody really is talking about right now. But just as a sort of conceptual matter, asylum is just this little sliver of our immigration system, really all of which is broken and needs fixing. But not right now, during a period of restrictionism, I would argue. This interesting cartoon, I think this is from the middle of the 1900s, but these are all of the previously marginalized populations coming together to build a wall to keep out the future immigrants. Okay, so let's talk about asylum. So asylum, this is the law that's this been, this is the statute that has been codified in our laws for 40 years, and I'm just gonna read it to you. Any alien who is physically present in the United States or who arrives in the United States, whether or not at a designated port of arrival, may apply for asylum. So right there in the definition, it says you gotta be here, and it doesn't matter how you got here. And that's been the asylum statute since it was created in our laws. These are the elements of asylum, the things that you have to prove, um, that you have to prove you're outside of your own country of nationality, that you're unable and unwilling uh, or unwilling to avail yourself of the protection of your country because you have been persecuted or you have a well-founded fear of persecution. And this is the hard one, this is the kicker, that that persecution that you suffered was on account of a protected ground, which are race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group and that the government either committed the persecution or that they're unable or unwilling to control the persecutor. You have to prove you can't live anywhere in your country safely, that internal relocation is not possible, and that you don't have any bars to eligibility, like you yourself haven't, haven't persecuted another person. This is how you qualify for asylum and also how you would qualify for refugee status. A refugee is very different than an asylee. A refugee is someone who gets their status outside of the United States, like in a refugee camp. But we, as a nation, are very selective about where we go and find our refugees and grant refugee status. And as you've all heard, this administration keeps whittling down the numbers of refugees that we admit every year. But asylum is anyone who comes to the border. That's the requirement, that's the difference. So asylum history, after the failure, the international failure, including our own failure during World War II to protect Jewish refugees who were fleeing the Holocaust, there was this international agreement, a UN treaty, um, defining what is a refugee. And we signed on to the treaty in 1951, and we ratified it in 1967, and then in 1980 we codified it. We put it into our statutes, with that statute that I showed you. Uh, this is not the first time that we well, let me back up a little bit, actually. Uh, so, so we codified it in 1980, 40 years ago, and we've been steadily building a body of case law 
about asylum. What is a particular protected particular social group? What counts as persecution? All of these things that need to be worked out have been worked out in the immigration courts over the last 40 years. And in a little bit, I'll talk about how the administration has been slashing um, all of this longstanding case law precedent that we've had. Uh, we had, in 1996, a, a big piece of immigration legislation that was passed actually by Bill Clinton called the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. It's referred to as IRA-IRA, and it had a bunch of bad stuff. Uh, but one of the things that I want to note is the creation of expedited removal. So expedited removal grants now the Department of Homeland Security the authority to just summarily deport anyone who's newly arrived to the United States. Um, the statute says up to two years. It's been applied up to 14 days. So since 96, it's been applied to border crossers, people who are caught, either come to the border or they're caught crossing the border. They are subject to expedited removal, meaning they're subject to mandatory detention, they have to be detained, and they just get sent back, unless they claim a fear of returning to their country. Then they're put through what's called the credible fear interview process, or the asylum interview process. And that process is that they have to tell their story to an asylum officer. It usually takes about an hour. And that Screening is meant to be a very wide net so that if this person could maybe qualify for asylum, they get passed through the interview, they get released from detention, and they start to prepare for their final hearing, which is, depending on the court, you know, months or years down the road. But in that court hearing, they testify, they submit evidence. We usually submit at least 500 pages of country conditions research and evidence on the case. We have an expert come and testify. They're subject to cross-examinations. Um, cross-examination, it's a very involved and intense process. And the studies historically have shown that more than 95% of asylum seekers who pass a credible fear interview go to their final hearing. They have every incentive to go to their hearing because if they don't go, they're going to be ordered deported in absentia. Um, so this sort of idea floated around that asylum seekers just abscond is not um, supported by the research. Um, the other thing that expedited removal did was it gave us this mandatory detention, which gave us the private prison industry for immigration. Um, and so we as a nation turned to private prison companies. Um, the two biggest ones are the GEO Group and Core Civic, which used to be um, the Corrections Corporation of America. And this is a multi-billion dollar a year industry, I think $8 billion at the last count, which is over $300 million per day. And as a result, they have created quite powerful lobbyists, and they make really big campaign contributions. Uh, so, but this system that we've had in place, this asylum system we've had in place for two decades now, and I would not stand up here and argue that it was perfect and that it didn't need fixing, but we actually didn't have a broken system, and we don't actually have a border crisis. We could have just kept going the way we were going, um, and things were pretty much working. We did have a crisis, of course, in Central America in the 1980s, and we failed to protect Central American asylum seekers at that point. Um, there was lots of litigation, and that resulted in sort of better options for Central Americans. But of course, time has passed, and here we are at the second, um, I, I would say the second Central American, um, I don't know, refugee crisis. Um, so. Then what happened was in 2005, President Bush um, was in office and they made a decision to bring in family detention, the first family detention center. There's been a tiny little detention center in Pennsylvania that holds about 100 people. It's a former nursing home. But the Tidon Hutto Detention Center, which was actually named after the founder of Core Civic, it's in Taylor, it's not in Hutto. Uh, was open in, I think, 2005 to house migrants. Um, and just like we see today, there wasn't a lot of thought put into the needs of children and families. So that was just a jail that was converted to house families. Uh, so the kids got prison uniforms. They were in their cells for up to 12 hours a day for count. They didn't have age-appropriate schooling. The medical care was bad. It was a terrible place. And uh, my professor at the law school, Barbara Hines, and the ACLU sued Core Civic and the Department of Homeland Security, and they 
settled for improved conditions. Um, but I had lots of experiences there as a law student. And I know lots of people in this room have been involved with Hutto over the years, protesting there and doing visitations. And um, thank you to everyone who still goes out there. It's still a facility that's open now for migrant women. So then um, Obama takes office in 2009, in January, <clears throat> and he ends family detention in 2009. But between 2009 and 2014, we see an increase in violence in Central America, and particularly in the Northern Triangle of Central America, of Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador. And the, based on my experience, what I've seen interviewing hundreds of people over the years, this is what I'm sharing with you, is just my anecdotal experience. Um, what's happening is that the gangs have taken over. They have infiltrated the local governments and the police departments. And the, the most vulnerable people in those countries are the children. Um, because boys are expected to join the gangs as soon as they reach puberty. And girls often are selected to become the sexual property of gang members. And if anyone in the family resists the conscription or the recruitment, they'll all be murdered um, or gang raped. And so we see more children. We see more families coming to seek asylum. The numbers haven't changed that drastically since the Obama administration, um, but we see more children and families. So the, the, the type of immigrants that are coming has shifted a whole lot. So we see this rise. We do see a rise between 2009 and 2014. Um, Obama's president, and then he brings back family detention in 2014, and that's when we get the Carnes and the Dilly Detention Centers. Um, has anyone been to Carnes or Dilly here? Lots of you. Great. Okay, so this is Dilly. Dilly's about an hour south of San Antonio. Um, it houses about 2,400 women and children. Looks a lot like the Japanese internment camps. Um, it's like a series of bunkers. I visited it. Um, I took a tour of it when it had just first opened. Um, I haven't been recently, but I, I don't think it's, it's changed very much. And it's through all of these changes in the last couple of years has continued to house families. Whereas Carnes, which is an hour southeast of San Antonio, this is the facility that I visit regularly. This has had a lot of changes just in the last year. It was First it was housing women and children, and then it went to dads and sons, um, which was a very interesting population to work with. Um, these dads and little boys, and it was, hard, it was a lot harder to, to get to them and to help the dads express their vulnerability. Um, and then it went to women, and now it's back. They just emptied it out last week, and it's back to families, um, fathers and children. And so this little girl that you see on the bottom right, the top, that's my daughter at a protest. Um, she's seven now, but she comes with me to a lot of protests. Um, and then the bottom is a little girl that I represented in, back then in 2014, Nayeli, who has a brain tumor. Um, and her, she came over with her daughter, her mother from El Salvador, who was, the mother was fleeing domestic violence. And she brought an MRI report from El Salvador proving that her daughter had this central brain tumor. And, ICE was not giving her any medical care and they weren't releasing her. So grassroots leadership, who, anyone from grassroots leadership in the room? Um, grassroots leadership helped me do a media campaign and she got out in 48 hours and it was really fast. And then Dell Children's uh, took over her care and she's moved, she's since moved. But that was sort of back in the era when media campaigns worked a lot better. Um, the Obama administration didn't like negative publicity about immigration cases, but now my experience is that in the Trump administration, I can be working on the most egregious case and someone can write about it, there can be a story about it, and they almost like double down uh, when, when negative publicity comes out about cases. So let's talk about what's happened since, the Trump, since Trump took office, um, which is a lot. Um, this is a whole lot. So in the last two years, Oh, let me start with last um, spring. The first thing that happened was turn backs and metering. So remember how for asylum you have to either come to the border or get in. Uh, starting in the spring of 2018, the Trump administration started putting Border Patrol officers in front of the, not the checkpoint, but the, the port of entries on the bridges. And so they started blocking asylum seekers from actually getting to the place where they can apply for asylum. And so they'd say, like, we're not processing anyone today. You have to go back. So that's when we started seeing these migrants, these Central American migrants, stuck on the border in Mexico because they couldn't get here to apply for asylum. But then what the administration did was they said, 
We're also going to enact zero tolerance for anyone who enters without inspection and gets app apprehended. And honestly, most of the migrants are actually just crossing the river and like flagging down border patrol. They're not actually trying to get through. It's, it, we, don't, we haven't had porous borders for over a decade. Uh, but so they started this, this zero tolerance policy and then used the zero, to, so zero tolerance was we're gonna prosecute everyone who enters without inspection. We're gonna prosecute them criminally for illegal entry, which means we take them from the border patrol station to the federal courthouse, they plead out in a big group, and we take them back to the border patrol station. And that whole process takes a couple of hours max. But the administration used that as an excuse to start the family separations. So the, the wording was, we're, we have to prosecute them, so we have to take the parents away because we're prosecuting them. And I did work at Hutto last summer with uh, mothers who had been separated. And what I saw was, um, in the beginning, the first mothers that I saw had had their children just physically ripped from their arms. Um, there was screaming and crying, a huge scene. The first one that I met was a little um, indigenous Guatemalan woman, didn't even speak Spanish very well. Um, didn't understand what was going on and had her five-year-old son ripped out from her arms, um, screaming and crying. Another woman that I met, oh God, I can't remember which country she was from, but I think her daughter was 10. And in that interview, we couldn't even, there, there was no conversation to be had about her asylum case or why she came. I and mean, she was just sobbing and literally just screaming hysterically. She had no idea where her daughter was. She had been ripped out of her arms. Um, and most of these mothers didn't know where their children were for two months, um, at least a month. They didn't even know where they were. And then maybe they got to start to talk to them once a week after that. Um, and, you know, the lucky ones got reunited within two months. Then obviously Border Patrol officers down on the border got um, wise. I don't want to use that word. But they started to realize that if they tricked the parents into the separations, that there would be less of a scene. So they started to tell the parents that um, we're gonna take your child in the other room for a, a picture or processing, or we're gonna bring you to the courthouse for your prosecution, and, and when you come back, your child will be, will be here. Um, and so those were the stories that we saw toward the end of the summer. And then thanks to the, you know, the massive public outcry and federal litigation, the you know, official zero tolerance policy of family separations ended. And about, I think total, I wanna, well, they didn't count. They didn't actually count. There was no database for who got separated and where they were sent. So that was what was so crazy working on these cases was trying to find these children. There wasn't like an agency you could call that was in charge and there wasn't a registration of who had been sent where. So it was like, sleuthing just to figure out where these children were. It was chaos and it was so crazy. Um, but, and the administration has even said they, don't, they didn't count, but we think it was somewhere around 3,000 or 3,500 families were separated. Okay, then we had, oh, I skipped asylum, the first asylum ban. So there's been three sort of major asylum changes since last year. The first was the asylum ban where the Trump administration issued, I think it was an executive order, trying to say that from now on, people who enter through the ports of entry, so with, in or without inspection, are not gonna qualify for asylum. Uh, but of course, as you guys saw in the statute, um, it's clear that it doesn't matter how a person entered, that they can still apply for asylum. So that policy was enjoined by the Ninth Circuit, but it is in litigation right now. We don't have a final decision on that. The second major policy was the MPP, or Remain in Mexico program, which is still ongoing. It has not been enjoined, and this is the policy that says that we're just going to send back asylum seekers to Mexico to await their hearings. And so last time I counted, which was weeks ago, over 36,000 people had been sent back to Mexico. And there's, it's indiscriminate. It's pregnant women, families, sick people, doesn't matter. If they're seeking asylum, they're from Central America, they can get sent back to Mexico. I mean, the lucky ones, honestly, are the ones who get through and get detained now. Um, and of course, the cartels have seized upon this opportunity. They kidnap and hold for ransom the migrants who are in Mexico. 
Um, many of them have cell phones, so they'll, what they do is they'll round them up, they take their phones, and they go through their contacts, and they call the person that they've contacted most recently, and the going rate is about $6,000 a person um, right now for the, for the kidnappings in Mexico. And, you know, let's hope they can find sh shelter and food and water. It's a complete disaster um, with the MPP program, and it is ongoing. And then... Hopefully these people can get themselves back to the border for their court hearings, which is just an insane affair from like 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. sometimes. Um, they're sheltered or shuffled through this tent court um, system where they see a judge by televideo who's in another city and they've got a translator and interpreter by phone. And there are valiant warriors down on the border trying to provide legal services to these poor people, um, but it is... It's, the access to counsel issues are just a nightmare. I mean, the, trying to prepare someone's asylum application, get the document to them so that they can bring the document to court um, is just a logistical, complete nightmare. Um, so then we have the asylum, so that's MPP, that's the second policy, and then we have the second asylum ban, which um, is the one that says that anyone travel, who travels through another country on their way to the United States must apply for asylum in that country um, and be denied before they can be eligible in the United States for asylum. That was initially enjoined by the Ninth Circuit nationwide, and so we were all sort of like, that, you know, that's stuck in the courts right now and it's not going forward, but this is the one that a couple weeks ago the Supreme Court lifted the injunction. Um, and so that policy is being implemented, and it affects any asylum seeker who has traveled through a land border, which is basically anyone who doesn't have a visa to the United States, because those are the only people who can fly directly here. So it affects, you know, the Cubans, Venezuelans, many of whom have very strong asylum claims. They've been politically persecuted, um, but they're now potentially going to be ineligible for asylum. So I think that if any of these policies are allowed by the federal courts, that the Trump administration will have effectively eviscerated asylum in the United States. Um, and all of these cases are actively in the Ninth Circuit right now. Um, two of them had a hearing last week, and so we're all just waiting to see what happens. I also want to say that family separations absolutely have been continuing, even though the zero tolerance policy ended. Um, now they're separating families where uh, over a thousand families have been separated since last summer and it's where there may not be a biological parent-child relationship, perhaps it's a grandparent or there are siblings, um, even if there's a legal custody document, doesn't matter, and if the parent has a previous immigration history um, or even a minor criminal history, the children will be taken from them. So I'll just tell you about two cases I've worked on in the last month. Um, one is a little girl who Okay, actually they're both little boys. One is a little boy of a mother whose bo biological father was murdered <clears throat> in Central America. So his mother's boyfriend, who's not his biological father, came over with him and the boy was taken by Border Patrol. The mother's here in the United States with a pending asylum application. She's a biological mother, she has a birth certificate that shows it. It took her over four months to get her son back uh, because the foster care facility in Indiana where he had been taken first told her that the extended stay hotel where she was staying was not permanent housing um, and so she had to get more permanent housing so she got an apartment and then I think I like I don't even remember what happened something happened with the apartment somebody didn't want to submit their fingerprints or she, and she didn't have a separate room for her son I mean, she was supposed to have a separate room for him so then she got another apartment and then they said, well, now you've moved too many times, so we're going to have to conduct a home study. So this little boy is six, and for four months he was in a foster care facility because of this nonsense. Um, another family that I represent um, is a friend of mine, Hilda, and her nephew came with his father. He's um, seven, and his big sister died from cancer in Honduras, and then he got cancer. And they think that there's been some environmental contamination because of a banana plantation near where they live. So they came to the United States, and this little boy has leukemia. He's, not, he's got a compromised immune system. He's not supposed to be around other children. They have documentation proving all of this. But dad was here 10 years ago and got deported. So he gets put in federal prosecution. He's still awaiting sentencing. This was three or four months ago. And the little boy gets put in a foster care facility um, with other children. 
And they take the documentation that proves that he has cancer, Border Patrol does, and so when I was communicating with the foster care shelter, I'm saying, this little kid, he cannot be in this facility. He needs to get out, he has cancer. And they're like, well, we need proof of it. And the documents are with Border Patrol, and you know, the Central American doctors are gonna take 20 days to issue the document. I mean, it's just like, it's insanity, and it's, it's ongoing. The family separations are absolutely ongoing. Oh, look, there's my family, how about that? Um, Let's see, sorry you guys, give me just a sec. <laughs> okay, let me see how I'm doing on time. We, we end at three, right? Okay, I'm gonna skip a couple slides and I'm gonna just say, um, I'd like to talk about Real quick, the abolish ICE movement. Because when I first heard this movement, I was a little confused about do we do we want to really abolish an entire agency and how what's the messaging here? Um, so here's what it has become. Here's what it means to me. Um, in the U.S., the immigration court system is a part of the Department of Justice. It's an executive branch court, and um, I think I had a slide to show that, but that means it's managed and run by the president, by the attorney general. The prosecutors in the court system are part of the Department of Homeland Security. They're also managed and supervised and run by the attorney general. The attorney general, and it, you know, on top of appointing, supervising the judges and the prosecutors, they can fire them. The other thing that they can do, the AG, is issue decisions to themselves um, and then issue precedential decisions that the judges have to follow. It's a it's, there is no judicial independence, there's no check and balance in the immigration court system. It is all the power resides within the executive branch. So that's where we see things like last summer, Jeff Sessions certifying the decision to himself, and uh, it was called Matter of AB, where he says from now on, victims of domestic violence will not count as a protected particular social group for, for asylum. And, um, also, in general, victims of private violence will no longer qualify for asylum. So it's like the sweeping policy dicta in a decision that then the courts turn around and have to follow. And there's no check on this power. So to me, abolish ICE just means we need to take some of the power out of this agency, out of the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice, and we need an independent judicial court system in the immigration world. That's what that means to me. Um, do you guys want to hear about the backlogs and some myth busting or do you want to move to Q&A? Backlogs, yes, okay. So I won't explain this whole chart to you, but this is the whole get in line. What does this mean to get in line? So in the United States, remember, it's primarily family-based immigration system. And so US citizens can petition their immediate relatives, their parents, their siblings, their spouses, and their children even if they're married or unmarried. Okay, that's not aunts and uncles, not cousins, not grandparents, uh, contrary to what the president might tell you. Um, and then the permanent, permanent residents, people who have green cards, can petition their spouses um, and their children who are unmarried. That's it, that's the limit of immigration. But they're, for all but immediate relatives of US citizens, there is a line for this petition. And so the way that it works is, let's say I'm a US citizen and my brother is Mexican and I want to bring him here. The, I first have to file a petition for him, it's called an I-130, and we get assigned a priority date, and we have to wait for that priority date to become current. So this is the visa bulletin that's published every month, and it tells us the wait time for each category. So if we're talking about my Mexican brother, oops, that didn't work. Um, we're talking about F4, is siblings of US citizens, and you see Mexico has its own column because China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines have more immigrants, so they each have their own wait time. So they're now processing cases from January 1st of 1997. So my brother's gonna have to wait at least two decades. But the other thing is you have to look at how fast the category is moving. They don't move in real time. So the way to gauge it is to look at this category a year ago and see how quickly it moved. I'll tell you that most of these categories tend to move in half time. So it's actually probably going to be more like 40 years. Uh, but at one time when I did the calculation, this category F2B, which is adult children of permanent residents, would have taken 512 years to become current at the current rate of speed. 
So this is what it can look like to get in line. It's sometimes way more than a lifetime. Anchor babies, anyone heard of an anchor baby? Okay, so the deal is that it doesn't really exist because um, first of all, a US citizen child cannot petition for a parent until they turn 21. So we're talking about really long wait. But also, if that parent entered without a visa, they can't adjust status. They're gonna to have to process through the consulate and they need a waiver, but they can't base the waiver on the child. So this is a conversation that I have in my office weekly with people who came in in the 90s usually. If they came in in the 80s, they, they applied for amnesty typically. But if they came in in the 90s, they've had four US citizen kids, they've been working, paying taxes, just waiting for their child to turn 21 and their kid's 20 and their birthday is four months from now and so they schedule an appointment and they come into my office to find out if they can get their green card. And I have to break it to them that there's no way to do it if you enter without a visa, although your 21-year-old child can file a petition for you, if you leave, you're not gonna be able to come back in because you can't get a waiver. Um, so there really is no anchor baby, that's a myth. And then I would just like to point out the invisible wall stuff, the stuff that's going on behind the scenes that people aren't really talking about uh, because there's so much else to talk about. But as an immigration practitioner, this has affected us so much. So the processing times have doubled in almost every case. It's up to two years just for citizenship um, when it used to take six months, depending on your jurisdiction. Um, we've had um, the memos issued by the Trump administration that said that if, if a document is missing in a green card application, like a divorce decree, they'll just deny it now instead of requesting the document. And then every denied case gets referred to deportation. Um, we've, the Trump administration has canceled, as you know, probably the DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, which is also going to be heard by the Supreme Court this year. So we'll see what happens with that program. Temporary Protected Status is a program that provides status for people who are in the United States when an infrastructure collapse happens in their country, usually like a natural disaster. So we've had TPS for Hondurans and Salvadorans since uh, 98 for Hondurans and since 2001 for Salvadorans. They've been working, they've been paying their taxes, they don't have a criminal history because you can't have a serious criminal history and qualify. They've been renewing their work permits every year. And then the Trump administration just yanks that program out from under them. Um, and I'm sure you heard that when the hurricane happened in the Bahamas, the administration denied TPS status um, to them as well. Uh, there was the public charge. This is a big one just from last week where the Trump administration said, even though we've had this process when someone put, um, applies for a green card through a family member, they have to get a sponsor who earns enough income to provide for this person while they have a green card. We, the system has been working. There were no problems with the system. And yet, the Trump administration created this sort of story, this narrative, um, that immigrants are on welfare, which they don't even qualify for, um, and so created this public charge rule that said that we're now gonna look at the credit score, the debts, the liabilities, whether they have health insurance. It's a 20-page form that honestly, most of us in the room probably wouldn't even pass. Um, in order to get a green card. <laughs> that was enjoined by the courts on Friday afternoon. And it was like a mad scramble. Every immigration lawyer in the country was scrambling to get all of our pending cases filed by Friday because the rule was set to take effect on Monday, but it was enjoined Friday afternoon. So we, we all got ahead on, <laughs> on our work. But that was another thing that the administration did. And then the MAVNI program, the program that allows immigrants you know, who are on temporary visas to join the military and serve in the military. That program has been canceled in a little way. So there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes that is just out of control. Um, and so I really want to pause now and, and give some time for a discussion. But one thing I do want to say is people always want to know what they can do. Um, and so, and you guys all in this room are already so active. I know that you are. But I don't want people to forget that if you don't have money to give, and if you're not an attorney that can't do pro bono work, and you don't speak Spanish, and for some reason, you know, you don't want to go down to the border, um, that it all comes down to the vote, to the ballot. All, it all comes down to the ballot. <laughs> so really, like, that's what we should be doing. We should be you know, going to the festivals and registering people to vote and just doing all that work that you guys do for your democratic organizations and keeping that stuff up. So thank you all for what you're doing. And I'll stop now and we can talk. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Yeah. Thank you.
Um, I mentioned, there we go, um, thank you. I mentioned before that uh, the Austin Sanctuary Network will be having a uh, fundraiser in about two weeks. Uh, Lynn Servini will be in the lobby uh, taking, selling tickets and taking donations if you care to do that today as well. Um, I've noticed that there are at least two people running for office in the audience. Um, if you're running for office, can you please stand up? We're going to give you a microphone to introduce yourselves. You can't make a speech, but what's important is that you're here and you have the same interest in immigration as we do, so we appreciate that. Thanks, Steve. My name is Rick Kennedy. I'm running for the United States Congress in the 17th District. Uh, if you don't know what that is, where that is, the current incumbent is Bill Flores, who announced his retirement. Yes, there you go. <laughs> he's gone, yes. Um, but he's gone, but uh, Pete Sessions has announced that he's running in the district, and I'm, I'm not going to say anything because I can't make a speech, but go do your homework. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon. I am Selena Alvarenga, and I am running for a criminal district court, 460th, uh, here in Travis County. I have a very personal interest in immigration. I am an immigrant. I was born in El Salvador, and I came to this country when I was 13. I have been here in Austin for um, about 17 years now. Um, I practice criminal defense and um, now and then get involved with uh, doing a little bit with uh, immigration and uh, um, volunteering for that. Um, but yes, I really appreciate you all being here and uh, talking and listening about this very, very important topic. Thank you. So, do we have any questions for Kate? Come on up. We're going to get in queue right here. And questions? Yes. As you know, or don't, I'm sure you do, uh, St. Andrews has a very personal uh, stake in this. And what is the future for people that have been, who are in asylum, but who have been denied and been ordered to be deported? What's their next step? Well, um, am I still on here? You know, this is an era of enforcement, and so I, I won't sugarcoat it. I mean, I think people who have outstanding orders of removal are more at risk than ever before. Um, one of the things that I've seen is that now sort of tips from the public to ICE actually get acted upon, and so just a few times in the last several months I've represented people who you know, got picked up because a neighbor called ICE on him. Um, or I, I represented a guy who, whose ex-wife got mad about their custody um, mediation and had ICE pick him up outside of the mediation at the end of the day. Uh, and so this is an era where ICE officers are out to get people, particularly the ones that have outstanding orders of removal because they're easy. They have an order, so they just send them home. Um, and so sanctuary places like this are really the last, the last stand, the last option for them. Yeah. Well, I, I had an experience with, uh, I took the training with the grassroots leadership and I went out to the Hutto place mm -hmm. and met with some ladies from Tibet. Mm -hmm. They had been asylum seekers fled from Tibet to Moscow, Moscow to Cuba. Cuba through the Panama Canal, and then they came up through Mexico. They're sitting there. So 
their bond was like five or thousand or something like that. They had relatives in the state. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had a nice little visit, and I told him I actually got to see the Dalai Lama when he was in Dallas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> George Bush was a big friend of his, and they gave him an honorary degree at SMU. My sister was a department head, and her admin person let me have her ticket. So I got to see. So we talked a little bit about Buddhism. When I left, I was so pissed off. Those guards, were, those guards were rude to us, to the volunteers. They were terrible. I found the CEO of whatever company that is that owns it. Wrote the CEO, told him he was horrible, <laughs> and then I wrote every rich Buddhist I know. I wrote, I wrote. I wrote Richard Gere. I wrote the Buddhist Society of Houston. I wrote the Buddhist Society of New York. I wrote the Buddhist Society of Toronto and uh, San Francisco. Anyway, I don't know what happened, but my brother-in-law is a criminal lawyer. And I said, Dennis, what happens to that bond? And he said, well, they should get it back mm -hmm. if they don't get in any trouble. But the whole thing was so frustrating that I... I need to go out there and visit some more, but I just, if you haven't been out, it's a concentration camp. And I mean, I just went nuts. But I was, when I, when I called to go out again, or when I went out again, they had all been sprung. Yeah, great. <laughs> come on, ladies, somebody come up. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm a professor down at Texas State and I study immigration and I've just um, been looking recently at all how it's become sort of a United Nations at the border and all these people are coming in through Ecuador and coming all the way up and there's Africans and mm -hmm. Asians and, mm -hmm. and in a way the, the breakdown of the asylum si system has invited people to come in because there's so much chaos is kind of how I see it but what how I mean, I guess they don't have access to lawyers, right? And what do you see happening with this just massive influx of people who, you know, are new, kind of, but they're, they're just arriving at the border, and it's kind of a new situation, it seems. Well, um, I think we have to be careful about, you know, buying into the, the crisis at the border um, narrative, because as I was saying, I mean, I think... The, the last time I looked at the numbers, I wish I had them in my brain, but I don't. The numbers between the migrants that we saw in 2014 during the Obama administration, the, the numbers that we've seen in the last year were almost the same. But we went from 11% families and children to 65% families and children. Um, and obviously those populations have different needs. And so the, the administration is telling us that we have this massive sort of influx and crisis, but we just have a shifting population. In terms of like, I'm sorry? Right. Well, the, there's a crisis in Mexico, certainly. Right. Yeah. And I don't mean, it's bad. It's really bad down there. And I don't know what they're going to do. And I don't know what the solution is. You know, I I haven't seen a lot from the Red Cross or some of these international humanitarian organizations down there. I'm sort of curious, like, why aren't they down there? You know, what's going on? And maybe it's political. I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, good point. Like, it's it's not just Central Americans in Mexico. It's everyone. It's global. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw a quote uh, recently in a news report from Mexico uh, about the situation down in uh, Matamoros, um, across from Brownsville, of uh, the Mexican president quoting um, Andres Lopez uh, Obrador, quoting that there's no humanitarian crisis in that city of Matamoros. Uh, and these were uh, Mexican news agencies that were reporting this. I mean, it's appalling that he's, it's appalling what he's doing in helping this president to just not care about anyone that is at our borders. Um, so I just saw that a few days ago on a, a Mexican news channel. 
uh, in several agencies were covering that. The other thing, my question is, are there any statistics or is anyone take, uh, looking into the adoption of these children, uh, of the asylum seeking children that have been put into foster care that have been adopted out? Is anyone following that? Oh, um, what's happening when they do get adopted? Or when they? I mean, they have parents. Parents what? are deported. What is happening to the children? And what can we do right. uh, as a society to, I mean, I know these parents are desperately looking for someone to adopt, but if they're taking these children, what can we do? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I had lots of people, especially last summer, reach out and say, can I, what, can I help these children? Can I you know, put them in my home? And 88% of the kids in ORR custody, the Office of Refugee Settlement, which is where the unaccompanied minors go, 88% of them have a family member in the United States to whom they could be released. Um, so the, I would argue that there is not a need for foster families. And then for the ones who are released to a foster, well, it's interesting. If they're released to a foster, what's supposed to happen is that if they're still in ORR custody, which they would be, some of these facilities have like, they go, the, for the daytime they go to the shelter and they just go sleep with a family at night and they come back for the, to the shelter for the day. So that counts as still ORR. And if the parents get deported, if they've been deported or if they're getting deported, they're supposed to be able to have the child return to them. Um, what can get trickier is if the child has been released to someone else um, and that that person doesn't want to return the child. That's when, you know, who knows what happens. Sure. Can you talk more about legal, the legal immigration? And you talked about the family chain, um, those dates that you used. Mm -hmm. Now, that date that you used, is that when they have to apply? Or is that going, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. It's a two-step process. You, you apply and you get assigned a priority date and then you wait, 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 wait until it becomes current and then you apply for them to actually come in. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I mean, is there a particular area you'd like me to talk more about Which it, within well, that? You know, my family's in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And so if they apply now, that would be that, that priority date. Right, and so who would date, we be right? talking about? Your... My, my husband's brother. Okay. Let's say my so I think they're in um, 2006. Let's look. Africa. Oh, Africa. Uh, to 2006. Uh, but that was they would have had to apply then. Right. So, if they have th so they're processing people that applied in 06. Right. So if you apply now, it'll be 13 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Maribel Rosas. Uh, I came here to Austin when I was 14. And uh, right now I, uh, I have DACA status. And because of the Trump administration, um, I'm in the limbo basically waiting for the Supreme Court hearing on the 12th. Um, I just wanted to share this. So my family is mixed status right now. My stepdad, he's a US citizen. Uh, he and my mom been together f for 10 years, and the only reason that my mom hasn't applied for uh, to get a resident card is because she's afraid of the administration current situation. And then myself, I had three kids that are U.S. citizens. So uh, basically, right now I'm just waiting for uh, whatever uh, the Supreme Court is going to decide on DACA. But I also have a question. Well, I had two questions. Um, is there any way that the public can know how much money Core Civic or these private um, um, facilities, how much are money are they getting from the government mm -hmm. to house these people, mm -hmm. especially in Tidon Haro, because I know that they haven't shared a lot of they haven't shared a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, is anything that you know um, the citizens of this country, you know, um, public officials? Does anyone that can do something about it just to see how much money they're getting from uh, the government? Mm -hmm. Because basically it looks like it is, um, it's something in there that they don't want the public to know. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, um, you know, when you were a asylum seeker, you just need to be present uh, in any port of entry, uh, yes, to um, request uh, asylum. Mm -hmm. 
And now, you know, they, they, you're from Guatemala and then you step like in Mexico or other part of the country, you had to now um, or, uh, request asylum there mm -hmm. for you to be, uh, to come to the United States. If there is another administration coming, can they reverse that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first question is, campaign. how do we know about campaign contributions yes. um, by the private prison companies? Um, I would say grassroots leadership is the best organization leading the charge on this. And I forget, is there anyone from GRL in that room? No. So this is a major focus of theirs, and they, they actually put out reports on it. So I would just invite you to go to their website or even call them. I'm sure someone like you would find a lot of you would find a home there, you know, and a way to do advocacy if you wanted. Um, and then the second question, what was the second question? Um, whenever they, um, is another administration yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, all of these policies, the MPP policy and then the Asylum Ban 2.0, which is the one that says you have to apply wherever you go through, um, these are, these were both implemented, you know, by executive order. So they could be reversed in a minute by a different executive, by a different president. Um, and they might, you know, still get held up in the courts, but we'll just see. I mean, an injunction, you know, when a case is ongoing, I'm not a federal litigator, so I'm not going to say this eloquently, but an injunction is just a preliminary decision to hold the place while the case is with the court. And so for a, for a court to block a policy under an injunction is a very um, powerful action. Most of the time, they just wait for the final decision. So that's what we've seen is this battle over these injunctions. And so it doesn't necessarily indicate just because the policies, the injunctions were blocked or the injunctions happened or didn't happen, that that's what the ultimate outcome is going to be. It's a very different inquiry at the end of the case. You know? So I'm still really hopeful. Um, that these policies aren't going to be implemented ultimately, but it's possible that we'll just have to wait for a new president to actually change them. We have time for two more questions, and here's the first one. <laughs> um, so, do I understand correctly, then, that the entire immigration system falls under the executive branch? Mm -hmm. um, is that a good thing? Does the entire immigration system fall under executive authority? Yes. Okay, so my next question is if it would be better served under the judicial branch? The court system, certainly. Um, the court system should be an independent judicial court system. And what would it take to move it from the executive branch to the judicial branch? Congress. A law or a constitutional amendment? Yeah, not a constitutional amendment. Definitely, yeah, just a law. Just a law. Just a law. Mm -hmm. So that brings our, our our the power of our vote even greater. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> vote. Um, so, I have done a little bit of uh, advocacy work on this, and one thing that I have noticed is that when I'm talking to uh, Democrats and their staffs and politicians is that, yes, uh, TPS, DACA, those things are on the table, but nobody that I have spoken to except Omar is really thinking about amnesty mm -hmm. in any meaningful way. And I'm wondering if there is a way that you think that we could have that conversation um, about amnesty because so many people in this country are here under orders of deportation mm -hmm. and really the only relief for those people as a large group is going to be amnesty. Yeah, I mean, I would say those are two different buckets for me. Amnesty would be everyone who's undocumented um, and just living in the shadows and then there's people with outstanding orders and I think that Let's say we get to the point in the next Congress where we've, we've actually got comprehensive immigration reform that could be acceptable to the Democrats on the table. My guess is that that will include a way toward permanent status for the undocumented. That's like, that's going to be 
a requirement of the Democrats to even sign on to anything. Um, I think it is less likely to get anything for people with outstanding orders. I think that population, they've already had their case decided by the court, and it's going to have to go back to the court to get it reopened. Is that possible? Yeah, it depends. So if, a, if, if someone's order deported in absentia, meaning they didn't go to court, um, then you can, you can move to reopen because they didn't get hearing, they didn't get notice of their hearing, excuse me, or if they were represented by a bad lawyer that they had ineffective assistance of counsel. But if they actually went to their hearing and they put on evidence and the judge just denied their case, there's an appeal process and they have to appeal within a certain amount of days. And if they, you know, 10 years later want to appeal, that's not really an option. So um, it depends, but in some cases, I mean, We've, we've been able to reopen a lot of old cases for no notice. Um, but it's harder when you go and you get deported and you're there, <laughs> you know, and, you're, and it's been a long time. Yeah. So, we're coming to the end. Thank goodness, right? Um, please fill out the survey form. It's very important. Uh, don't forget, you're at St. Andrews, so there is cake and coffee out there for you. <laughs> you always have cake and coffee. And I uh, really want to thank uh, Kate for coming out and being with us today. Please. Her, her knowledge and dedication to this cause is tremendous, and we truly thank her very, very much. Thanks thank again. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Thanks for being awesome. here. Thanks. One, one more. Um, I was just going to mention, I'm going to echo exactly what Kate said. Uh, Voting is really important. That's our only power now. I mean, we are just boxed into a corner. Uh, we went to a kickoff of the Blue Action Democrats of North Austin. So I would encourage each one of you to get in, involved with a, some sort of candidate and do some phone banking, do some postcards, do a lot of things. That's the only relief we have. So it's going to take time, unfortunately, and I think it's really important that we do that. The other thing, just another mention, on NPR I heard a, that there is a nonprofit that is trying to register young people. And I'm going to contribute to them because the amazing thing is, is that a new voter registered is five times more likely to vote Democratic than Republican. So if you can register, even, you know, just go out and register, you can't tell them, well, I'm not going to register Republicans. But by the same token, you get some new people, the odds are very, very good that they're going to come up with voting for a Democrat, especially the young people. So, so get out there and get involved. Now's the, now's the time. And I want to thank our two politicians that came. You know, you know in that, who's in District uh, 17, U.S. House District? You, whoever's there better get behind them. I mean, who's, who's? Wells Branch. Wells Branch. Come on, kids. <laughs> get involved. Thank you. <laughs>